rule of thumb to select the discount rate. I did an old video on this, and I'm going to hopefully be starting my old videos again. I need a screwdriver to unscrew my old computer and fix it up so that I can get all the old videos off of it. But basically, the way the discount rate works is you start with the risk-free rate. And I also have a tablet to draw, so I'm using my mouse right now, which isn't very great. And the risk-free rate is generally defined as the US 10-year, which basically is a barometer of inflation. So this is equal to inflation. Then there's something people call the equity risk premium, which is the amount you need to be paid to take the risk to buy stocks. You know, which, which people sort of assign kind of an arbitrary percentage to. There's a way to think about calculating it, but, you know, it's kind of beyond our scope. But you could say it's 1% to 3% above bonds, right? So the nice thing about a bond, like a 10-year or corporate bond, is that it's a promise. It's, it's a contract, right? They have to pay you. They don't pay you. You see them in court. It's you're borrowing money. You've got to repay it, right? It's a written contract. That's what a bond is. Um, Equity doesn't work that way. Equity is a share in the business. They don't have to pay you anything. Right? You have a share in the business. If the business is going well, they can pay a dividend. If that dividend uh, is stable, you will get some income, but you have a claim on the company's assets, which is very different from a debt contract, right? So you've got to get paid more for that risk. If the company goes bankrupt, Debt holders can still often get quite a quite a, a bit of their money back. When a company goes bankrupt, usually equity holders get nothing. So you got to get paid more to take that risk, and that that amount is usually something like one to three percent. So if you take the risk-free rate, call that three percent, two or three percent, which is long-term inflation. Add another three percent, you're talking about six percent, and you kind of look at the discount of something. Let's say some country like Brazil or, I don't know, um, some other country or, or company like Johnson & Johnson or whatever has 6% bond, you know, and you say, well, I'm getting 6% earnings yield on a company, which is better? You know, that's kind of one way to look at it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, so equity risk premium is just the base for any equity. And then you kind of, I, I'd like to add, you know, another 1% to 10%, depending on how risky I perceive the company to be. You know, really not risky companies that barely add anything, but really risky companies that could add as much as 10%. So that's how the discount rate works. And it's a good way to normalize relative risk, but it's not the only way. I think it's a fairly crude instrument. Some people use beta, which is, you know, basically the stock's correlation to the market. Um, and beta is uh, not a bad measure, but I think it's very imperfect. Um, there's all kinds of ways to think about this. And I'm thinking about doing like an academic finance tutorial because I did like a practical finance tutorial, but I think an academic one would be helpful um, as well. Talk, talk all about WAC and Kaplan and all that stuff that I studied in college, but nobody ever uses in real life. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the it's funny because if you look at like sovereigns, let's say the U.S., Germany, Switzerland, Japan, these are all safe countries, right? This is like an order of risk. And really, I should move these kind of like side by side, right? But then if I go a little riskier, I don't know, let's say New Zealand. Let's say South Korea. Let's say Brazil. It's like tier two. Then I go really risky, UK. Second tier countries, you know, India, okay. And now I go to the third, third tier, you know, third tier countries that are really risky. Like these are countries that could go bankrupt anytime. We can think about like frontier economies like Indonesia, right? Malaysia. Pakistan, um, Poland, Hungary, like Eastern Europe, those types of countries, Chile, 
et cetera, you know, the, the yields increase. So if they, these are 2% yields or 3% yields, it makes sense that this is 4 to 5%, and it makes sense that you need, I need 6 to 8% if I'm going to invest in these countries. And there's two risks principally in a bond, right? Inflation risk, and each country has a bit of a different inflation. And then there's the actual uh, repayment risk. There's the default risk. Are they just not going to pay you? Right? Are they unable, basically, to pay you? And so there's both. And they're pretty tied together, but they're not always tied together. You can have low inflation, but still the company or the country defaults. So the same thing applies in corporate bonds, right? You have strong corporations like an Apple or a J&J &J that are never, never default. You got more medium risk bonds, like, I don't know, uh, let's pick a Best Buy or something like that. They might default if something crazy happens. And then you got really risky companies like say GameStop. GameStop doesn't have debt, but it may be an AMC. These guys are super risky. There's a decent chance they will default on their debt. So you'd rather buy, in a lot of cases, a senior corporate bond like Apple or Johnson & Johnson than buy sovereign country debt of a country like Pakistan, right? What's safer? Is Apple more likely to pay you back than the government of Pakistan? Probably, right? <laughs> Even though it's a sovereign nation that has sworn on their army that they will pay back this money. I don't know. I'm trusting, the, I'm trusting Apple. So the yield on Apple will probably be lower um, than the yield on Pakistan sovereign debt, or maybe even Swedish or Finnish sovereign debt, right? That might be a toss up. Finland versus Apple might be a toss up. Okay, so anyway, what does this have to do with equities? Well, it's the same concept. When you look at equity risk premium, you might uh, think about it uh, a few different ways, but one of the interesting ways people really like to think about it is dividend yield. There are some companies like Abbott and Johnson & Johnson that have paid dividends forever, and they have a, a dividend yield. Dividend yield fluctuates with stock price, but you know their dividend yield could be as high as 2 to 3%. And if you look at it, what does that remind you of? Well, it reminds you of corporate bonds. But you're getting a 2 or 3%, but you still have default risk if the things go poorly, they can slash that dividend, but they can't slash their obligation to pay you on the bond side. So a lot of people sort of conflate dividend yield and bond yield. And you can think about it as a carry trade, right? If you go long the Abbott stock and you go short the Abbott bonds, you would have to collect a net carry of zero, right? Because you have to pay interest when you short debt. You collect in the dividend when you are long the stock. So you give you a net nothing, but the prices of these two things will move too. The price of the bond won't move much. The price stays the same, but you'll have the price of the stock, which will hopefully go up over the long term. So this is a great hedge, in my opinion. Uh, if the company goes bankrupt, um, this might not perform as well as this. So you might do the reverse trade as well, depending on how you feel about the company. Um, that's what that would be if, let's say, you were bearish or something. So it's important to think about stocks as kind of like cash flow generating machines to some extent, depending on the kind of business. You can't think of that for something like a Google. I think it's as stable as Google's business looks. It's still fairly young. But if you think about something like a Coca-Cola that way, I think that makes more sense. A lot of stocks shouldn't be looked at this way. And stocks that shouldn't be looked at this way probably deserve higher discount rates. That's why I always kind of do something like 6 to 8% or more for stocks. Like you notice for Google, I do 8%. And some people might say, ah, it's too much. You know, Google's a really great business. But I think that um, it's, it's still relatively young.